Um, it's my great pleasure now to uh, invite uh, Terry, um, I don't know why I'm, it's your gaffe really, I don't know why I'm doing this, anyway, um, to invite uh, the first speaker of Tech Tuesday Club. Uh, so a huge round of applause please for Sir Terry Matthews. Now isn't this a pleasure? So here I am at the Celtic Manor. How many people know here that the world's first millionaire was at the Celtic Manor? You see, that was Thomas Powell. He found the anthracite coal here. Isn't that amazing? And the world's first million pounds contract was signed in the dining room in that old manor house. See, kind of an interesting little sight, this. In any event, so tonight we launch Tech Tuesday, the first Tuesday of every month. I tried this, started it off two years ago in the city I live in, in Ottawa. This is a city where if you look at the greater area, it's about a million people. Not so far out of line with this region around the, uh, the Bristol Channel. And it started off, I think, there was some sort of incentive to get people to come in. It's held on the first Tuesday of every month. This month, there were 450 people turned up. And there are, in fact, in the city I live in, 2,000 high-tech companies. Some are a good size, 100, 200 million dollars a year, and many down at the sort of one to 10 million dollars. But it's a very, very active environment. People who are experienced, some people with a little graying hair, mix in with younger people and sometimes mentor them, sometimes fund them, but it's a very active community networking together. Then after about three months, we began to put presentations on. Interesting that some of the presentations are about downfall. So this month, in the month of June, an expert spoke about all of the attributes and the downfall of Nortel, one of the largest companies in the world. So much was learned from this exercise of analyzing why did the company fail? I mean, this is a Canadian icon and it failed. There was an absolute packed audience, over 400 people wanting to know over a period of 45 minutes, what was it that went on? I was personally very uh, pleased to have gone through that and learned some of the things that created that downfall. I thought I knew the company, but I picked up all kinds of things. So I invite everyone in here, you're all members of Tech Tuesday. And we'll keep you informed of what's going on month over month. First Tuesday of every month. I think, Simon, it's like 5.30 till 7.30, something like that. A little short space of time on a Tuesday evening. And I must tell you, I've, I've been delighted with the, the things that came out of it, the mixture in social networking of people that are in that high-tech area, encourage them, sometimes mentor them, but it just works. So that, that's it. This is the first Tech Tuesday. I know it's not the first Tuesday of the month, but it launches it here at the Celtic Manor. And I think it's, uh, it's right to say that the next one will be held at the Lodge. Is that right? Yeah, there's a Lodge, which is at the top of the hill. Great view of the Bristol Channel, by the way. So, uh, so let me uh, uh, just thank everyone for coming and, and hope that you'll, uh, you'll join us at least uh, as many as possible, come to this Tech Tuesday. Mix in with some of the younger people and help them out. I know for me, in the first company that I started, most of you will know that company was Mitel. After six months, I was lucky enough that a group of lawyers from the Ottawa area decided to put a little money in the company, and they spent their time giving guidance. And as a 29-year-old, I can tell you that made a huge impact in that sort of professional guidance to keep the company with good governance, keep the company in a manner where it had a board of directors, regular quarterly reviews and so on. These are things, these might sound simple to many people in this room. Young people might come out of universities very well educated, but the fact is they're not experienced and they don't know what they don't know. Our job with a little gray hair is to help them learn help them learn how to run a business, help them learn how to interact with clients, be professional about it. In any event, all right, so our next item, I'm told, is uh, somebody who's come from MIT, Anthony Vanke, will be talking to us all. 
So can I introduce you please to Anthony Vanke. Thank you very much. I'll sit here for a little bit. <laughs> so thank you all for having me. Uh, I have to say this is my first time in Wales, so this has been a pleasure. I actually got the rain and the sun, so I got to see how green and lush everything can be. Um, so it's really exciting. I have to say it's also really exciting to be in the inertia of all the events that have happened. Um, you know, the discussions yesterday with the young, uh, younger people, the young professionals, young minds that are coming in, uh, I'm really honored to be in their wake and also, you know, that table over there. Uh, and it's really exciting because uh, I didn't know that I was going to be the inaugural speaker for this series. So this is cool. I get to put that on my, my CV or something, right? Um, sorry, I also tell a lot of bad jokes. I don't know that they'll actually transfer. Uh, you know, we may say the same words. We have different languages on the other side of the ocean, unfortunately. Um, but also, you know, that this is the beginning of hopefully a much longer collaboration um, with my community, the MIT community, all 11,000 of us um, in Cambridge, Mass, with you all here. Um, so hopefully the discussions will continue uh, in earnest, looking forward. But I'll introduce you to uh, the work of my lab. Um, I'm one member of a, a team of 40 um, in uh, two parts of the world, the Sensible City Lab which uh, is a pain whenever you type it into Word because you get a little squiggle under our name. But we, you know, we've heard a lot about the smart city, but we have a different take. You know, we were lucky that we really moved into the domain of uh, intelligent urbanism uh, about 10 years ago. I wish we had trademarked the word smart cities because we'd be making a lot more money off of the royalties. But we see it as a sensible city because citizens uh, and the engagement with citizens, people, and the places in which we live isn't just about operational aspects. Are the green lights, you know? optimized, is the energy flow optimized, but it's about how do you make the spaces in which we live better for all. And we start with this. This is quite literally every phone call, every email, every SMS message. I love you, thank you, goodbye. Congratulations on the business deal. Actually, we should see other people. This is all of the telecommunications sent over the Ericsson Global Network, which services a lot of the, the, the providers that we know over the span of one week, and we call this the signature of humanity. Because when you look at the patterns of how we speak, to whom we speak, you can actually tell amazing stories about citizens around the world and in our own communities. And when we talk about big data, what is big data? It's scary, it's, it's anomalous, it's everywhere, but for us it's also this number. Five exabytes of data. This is the amount of information we produced since the dawn of humanity to the year 2003. This is every Gutenberg Bible, every New York Times, every bad story on CNN or the BBC. But this is also the same amount of data that we produce now every 36 hours. This is an incredible amount of data. And it's not just people talking, it's devices talking, it's the spaces in which we live talking back. So for us, as a lab and as a community, how do we leverage this data, not only to optimize the cities in which we live, but to also provide new technologies uh, for that, that being an urban population, the new devices, new designs, new spaces, quite literally rethinking the architecture and the urbanism and the urban design of our communities to the analysis of people and uh, the places. And you know, and for us, it's interesting to think about the city and not just about technology. We're housed in the Department of Urban Studies and Planning, which is weird for a group of people who, uh, whose disciplines range from computer science to civil engineering to architecture. But because if we just talk about technology, this is the future of the city. This was actually on our campus, that we would all live in these boxes. We wouldn't have to fly. The airline industry would be dead. That poor man who is the air traffic controller would be out of a job because we'd be talking over computer screens. But we know that reality didn't happen. Cities now are more important than ever because although they're only 2% of the Earth's crust, they're 50% of the urban population, 75% of uh, uh, energy consumption, 80% of CO2 emissions come from our cities. So a small change on the Earth's crust can actually make big change and especially because now we're building more cities than we ever have in the history of humanity. China is seeing more movement to cities than we've seen over the course of humanity. 
So cities are really the canvases for this future. So to start with that, I'll take you a little bit further back to 2006 with our first project to really kind of explain what it is that we do. And it's fun because uh, in a couple days, the World Cup will be starting in Brazil. Uh, the US is probably gonna get knocked out really quickly, but we're gonna talk about a happier time. Uh, you know, 2006, it was in Germany um, and was famous for the, the, the final. France versus Italy, uh, the Zaydan headbutt and the red card. The cool thing is, within this exhibit, within the space of the Venice Biennale, we actually want to see, uh, can we draw a map of the city in real time? And we use mobile phone data to see the city live and breathe during this day. So what you're seeing is that cell phone activity uh, geolocated in space. Um, it's Rome, so people wake up a little bit later than you know, probably people up here. Uh, so you see noon, people are starting to, to wake up, uh, live their daily lives. But then before the match, and then as the match begins, you'll see the city goes quiet. France scores, Italy scores. Half time, everyone sends a quick message, phone call, second half begins. End of normal time, first overtime, second overtime, this is getting exciting. The Zidane headbutt, and then the match ends, Italy wins. The city literally erupts in excitement. But the cool thing is, especially if you're in planning, what happens the next day? Because the trophy will actually come to Rome. The prime minister will meet the team. Uh, and you'll see uh, the city moving up to that northern quadrant, the Circo Maximo, the festival heart of Rome. And you'll see, once the team comes, you'll see the spike in activity right there. And you actually see the people. So for us as planners and designers, our question is for cities, if you know where the people are, and you know where the buses are, or where urban assets are, why aren't buses running after people? Why is it that I'm still running after the bus every day at MIT? So from there, uh, you know, we moved to Singapore, where I said we have, a, uh, we have two locations. We have a lab full-time in Singapore um, with 10 people working there. And we're really looking at not just that cell phone data, but how do you leverage the data, uh, not just for the decision makers, the people in City Hall, but for everyone. This was an old project at MIT, the economic control room for the government of Chile, where you would have old wise men sitting in these chairs looking at indicators, making decisions, literally in real time, pushing buttons, more corn, less fuel. But suffice it to say, if this worked, uh, the economy of Chile would be a little bit different. And lo, 2012, we do the same thing, not us, but IBM. No offense to our friends from IBM. We know you all really well. Uh, but that we do the same thing, a very top-down infrastructure where the data, although the combination of data is powerful, how do you actually have many people participate? Especially when you think that that device in your pocket, not only was it just hacked a second ago, uh, it has more processing power than the US government had to send man to the moon. So can we actually leverage this as a mechanism, not just the big screen, but those screens in your pocket and really make an internet of the city, not just the internet of everything, but really geared towards the ideas of citizens. So moving from an open platform for historic data, which you know, we have you know, data.gov in the United States, the Open Data Initiative here in the UK, to one for the, the internet of the city, actually opening up all the data of the city, providing it to both decision makers, to citizens, but to also industry. How do you monetize some of this data? How do you actually allow companies to combine data while still respecting privacy and anonymity? So for our first phase, and this was probably about two and a half years ago, which I'll show you, we want to start this discussion. How do you actually bring different data providers together within the city? So we worked with several people, SenSam, who are our colleagues um, looking at environmental sensing, um, an MIT-based lab, uh, Changi Airport, Comfort Del Gro, which manages taxis, the environmental agency, Ports, Singtel, which is um, telecom, and then uh, energy, um, and then, at the Singapore Art Museum, we wanted to make this first public, make this first available. Of course, we still had a lot of technical challenges uh, to overcome, but we wanted to at least get the citizens, the decision makers, the public and industry involved and really have a discussion with them about what this internet of the city looks like. And you'll see some of those visualizations from this first phase.
So first, much like the case in Rome, how do you understand where people are and the human activities in space? So looking at uh, data from Singtel, visualized in real time. Looking at the energy consumption patterns and then meteorological data. Are you actually making the urban environment warmer through the use of energy, which is mainly being used to cool down buildings? Looking at special events, social media, what's happening with people, how excited are they, and what are the emotions? To even something as silly as, can you find a taxi when it rains? So looking at real-time GPS probes and availability of taxis and correlating it with weather and meteorological data. And in fact, you cannot find a taxi when it rains. And using those same taxis as probes in the city, redrawing the map of Singapore based on time it takes for you to get home versus the distance, growing and shrinking as traffic gets worse or better. Then looking at the flows of people both in and out beyond the borders of this little city, so the airport, but then also looking at the, the goods moving with the, the, the shipping ports and the global connectivity of the city to the rest of the world. But as I said, we wanted to make this public. And for those visualizations, although great, took you know, some of the most brilliant minds in the world weeks and a messy process to just make one of those. And if we want to make this data available to the general public, we can't ask everyone to have an MIT programmer or one of these like, you know, uh, you know, really inspiring minds um, coming from the events uh, yesterday and today. So we want to transform that complex process into a tool for many to use, which we're working on now, which is called the data browser, that we actually take all of this information from the city, reduce it down in a way that actually makes sense, um, and actually lets other people make tools for it. So we'll have a visualization tool that you can go online and test it. You could also plug in your own you know, data. If you don't want to share it, fine. Just upload your own thing, see what it looks like in combination with the urban data. But then also allowing developers to access this information. As I said, Singtel has a motivation to make more money. They have shareholders. Well, they can make this data available, but then an app developer can also use this to make the new cool app, the new killer app. And we also want to make this data available everywhere, including the bus stop. Can you have someone actually decide what bus should I take? Uh, next, based on the weather, the traffic patterns, and also what's going on. And right now, we always say, send more buses, make the ride more comfortable. But what if it's actually a matter of just waiting three more minutes for an empty bus and making sure that you have a seat and being much more comfortable, much more cost effective for a city? So let's actually move a little bit closer to home. So we've shown how, or I've shown how we look at providing new tools and leveraging the data of the city. Well, going back to the storytelling, what about us? Uh, I'd like to say uh, that we used to have more cell phone data than the NSA. Suffice to say, we were clearly wrong. Uh, <laughs> uh, but the cell phone is an amazing piece of technology because it can tell so much about us and the places in which we live and the communities, including what's happening in our own backyard. So I'll actually show you a project that uh, Ten Downing actually asked us, uh, a provocative question. What if you drew constituencies based on connectivity of people and not the borders between lords who feuded a millennia ago? So based on the cell phone communications you'll see, and the arcs representing those connections between places, through algorithms that we developed in the lab, we can actually generate regions or constituencies based on, on how we actually talk, how we communicate, the connections between us. Sometimes they're surprising that they go across boundaries and sometimes they're not. In the case that Scotland, we know the discussions that they're having with their referendum, that Scotland itself is actually its own self-contained community. And we can apply this also as well. We've looked at this in Singapore, so you can actually find the neighborhoods in Singapore. And you can actually see that there are reasons why maybe some areas are more poor. They're not connected with the rest of the city. Or France, you know, our friends to the south. Uh, looking at, actually, in this case, the political boundaries do reinforce, or the social connections actually reinforce the political boundaries. Um, and in Belgium, what does that look like? And we thought, well, we know the, the, the famous case in Belgium, you know, with the languages, the Flemish and the Walloon. Can you actually draw, you know, the differences between these places? And actually, based on the cell phone communications, you can. You can actually see these two regions. And they actually don't necessarily just follow the same political boundaries, as always. 
But using that same data, or same type of data, or the process of analyzing data and really thinking about what they can actually say, we looked at New York. You know, there's always a rivalry between Boston and New York, but they're a little bigger and they're a little flashier and cooler for people outside of our country. But we looked at a very unique data set. There are 13,500 taxis in the city of New York, and we looked at the 150 million trips in the city um, to see what patterns could we find. And we visualized it, so every pickup and drop-off we can actually see. But when we did the analysis, we found something interesting. If you got New Yorkers to do just two simple things, number one, share their ride with one additional party, someone else, but at the same time, be willing to just add two minutes to their taxi ride. Not a lot. So you're picking one additional person up and then just adding no more than two minutes. We found that you can actually reduce the total number of rides in the city of New York by 50%. So you can eliminate 50% of the taxis, especially in a city that's talking about congestion pricing. Or you could actually empower the drivers and say, you know what, work less but make the same amount of money. And we, the interesting thing is, is that not only in New York, we're doing this research in other cities around the world, London, Singapore, um, places in Canada, and actually similar trends hold. The time might fluctuate, but you can actually reduce overwhelmingly. So how do you do this? Of course, there's uh, you know, real-time analytics have to be done and all of that. But that to share some of this complex mathematics with people, we actually want to make this public. So if you actually go to hubcab.org right now, you can actually explore the sharing potential. And you can pick any two places in the city of New York that you want. In this case, two random points. Um, and you can actually calculate in real time how many connections are happening between those two locations, but also how much money could you save. So in the span of one year, just between these two points, if New Yorkers shared, you could save $3 million. And on top of that, you could share over a million miles of travel time. So that's amazing, a lot of efficiencies to be found. Now, we've talked about the Internet of Things and the Internet of Everything. Uh, and we had this discussion with uh, Qualcomm several years ago, and they said, you know, people talk about the Internet of Things, but what does it actually mean for people? You know, is this speaker going to talk back or is that cup going to talk back? But what does it actually matter? And we said, yeah, actually, I maybe don't care about that glass talking back to me. But what if I actually wanted to see it? Because, you know, for some of you in your own companies, you have optimized the supply chain so well that you know where every atom comes from. You know the mines where the metal for that MacBook came from. We've done this. We know it. But if you talk about the internet of everything and things really talking back, what about the opposite? What happens when you throw that thing away? No one actually knows. Nowhere in the world do we actually know where our waste really goes. So we actually want to say, okay, maybe it's not the glass. Maybe it's a thing that we really don't care anything about that talks back. And that could actually show the power of the internet of things. So what's the thing that we care the least about? The thing we throw away. So with 500 volunteers in the city of Seattle, with 3,000 pieces of trash, we actually want to see where trash goes. So we developed tags in-house um, to track this trash, a representative sample. We got anything and everything. Um, so these were the, the, the tags that we deployed with, with what you're going to see. And later we worked with Qualcomm and just hacked something that they had. Hacking in a good way, not in the scary, I'm going to look at your phone way. Uh, again, 500 volunteers. 3,000 pieces of trash. And Seattle actually is a fairly green city. They incinerate a lot of their trash for energy and recycle, have one of the highest recycling rates in the United States. But we got everything and anything. And how we got it tagged into a banana peel, I have no idea. Uh, MIT ingenuity right there or something, I guess. But then we asked people to take it home and throw it away as they normally would. So the day of deployment, things stayed regional, went to those processing facilities. But after two weeks, something interesting thing happened. The map literally spanned the breadth of the continent of the, United, of the United States, but also going into Canada and Mexico. No one had ever seen this map before. No one in industry, no one in government, no one. The reason why is that every time a company hands that waste off to someone else to process, they might actually hand it off to a subcontractor, to a sub-subcontractor. And every time we do that, data is lost. And you can see after two months, things were still moving across the country. 
so we can think about what it actually means when things talk back, particularly when you find interesting stories like this. Two, waste, uh, two printer cartridges, exactly the same, took two very different routes to the same place, to Baja, Mexico. One went down the coast of California, but one went to Chicago and then came back. Interesting thing, the longer trajectory actually had a smaller carbon footprint because it went by rail. So it actually says really amazing things. Well, what about the other side? We also want to see the donation cycle. So we had these computers um, that we uh, put some software onto and with the permission of foundations around the world. We actually donated these with, uh, with the caveat that we would actually get to see through the eyes of those devices. Um, you know, we didn't have a lot of money. We relied on volunteers. One was destined for Chile. Uh, unfortunately, that person got sick and ill. So it got left behind at MIT. And that's the beginning of its story. So this exhibit that we had at the Museum of Modern Art with these devices sent around the world that we could actually see through their cameras, through their lenses, their GPS tracks to find this kind of amazing tapestry of how people use these computers. But one day that computer was left behind, went somewhere else because we were broken into. Several things were taken, unfortunately. I lost a mouse, but one of the things that was taken, I think you know where this is going, was one of our self-reporting machines that we were actually able to see its trajectory through the city. And not only that, we were getting photographs back, which was, unfortunately for us, a great lesson in the legal system in the United States, so. So of course, you know, with the Internet of Things, we can learn a lot when things talk back to us, including lessons like uh, that you should never steal from MIT. So, you know. I'll show you two quick projects, and then uh, I don't want to keep you any longer from your drinks. But talking about the Internet of Things, we also want to talk about the emotional aspects with things. You know, we've worked with Volkswagen and Audi a lot. They're good friends of ours. But we always criticize them on this. They're advertising. You know, look at this. It's a sexy image of a car. And they say, everything's washed up because the car is so sexy. Watch an ad. They're driving the Audemars. They're driving in the Grand Canyon. Not a car to be seen. A great emotive experience. But this is your real commute, at least in the United States. I mean, that thing right there is an Audi. You know, the biggest brand disconnect you could have. So for us, we were wondering, what is that emotive aspect? Can we model and derive emotive aspects of, of commuting? So we developed the Road Frustration Index, which was a theoretical algorithm that culled together information to talk about um, what our commute feels like. But how do you calibrate it? It was incredibly stressful. It was the most stressful drive I've ever been on. Nevertheless, I think we have a lot of great content to measure road frustration. So Kale is our test driver zero where actually we want to calibrate the road frustration index by uh, actually collecting data about a commute. And we want to scale this up to, to several cities um, around the world. But first we need to start with one person. So we were looking at GPS, um, cameras both in and out to see the environment and what he's doing, a connect to measure micro body movements and skin conductance to measure his stress or arousal as Audi likes to tell us. We can't tell the difference with it, but you know, we sent him out into the roads of Boston. Unfortunately, on the first test drive, and this was not planned, he got into an accident in a brand new Audi. Okay, stop the car. So we were just sideswiped, um, and right now my stress level should be through the roof. Um, we got the information, you know, we'll have to process the data and, and see where it's really at. So looking at just the stress in this case, this is him, stress, being, uh, having breakfast, giving a presentation to lab in the MIT econ class, and then, of course, driving. Shit. Sorry, this was a PG-13 presentation. Jesus. But then, of course, we have to find what the upper bound is. So what else do you do to your poor researcher? You throw him out of a plane. 
So for our last project, I want to tell you something that we're doing right now that we're investigating called Skycall. And we know about the environment of drones, you know, everything from the scary stuff that the military is doing um, to fun things like agriculture and imaging. I think you said that you had a camera in yours to the sushi copter, which we wish we came up with, uh, but sadly not. But we really want to look at the drone as a platform for urban aspects. It's great to fly at 33,000 feet, but what does it mean when you actually have to worry about buildings and trees? So we actually want to start with a complex urban environment. And of course, what's the most complex place we could think of? If you've been on our campus, uh, it's where we live, MIT. And because we're only about a mile from Harvard, we have to make fun of our friends. And literally, we number everything. There are no building names. Everything's a number, so. Welcome to MIT. Where would you like to go? Follow me, please. the largest research lab at MIT. To one your of the right, most the media lab. To your left, research. the status center. Follow me, please. And of course, it takes you the most direct route to our campus, of course. You have arrived. Welcome to Sensible City Lab. <laughs> Goodbye. So for the next test case, we're actually uh, looking to deploy this in a project that we call Waterfly, which will actually be used as um, environmental sensors in the environment. And the cool thing is, especially being in Wales, um, we're using, an, you know, even in that case, we, we did a little bit of hacker, but we're using off-the-shelf products. In this case, we're really happy to work with uh, BCB, which is actually in Cardiff here. Um, so this is actually uh, heading to Cambridge tomorrow. So I think it's going to get shipped back, where we're going to start hacking at it. Um, and we're working with the EPA to actually do water measurements uh, um, in the... the, the uh, Charles River in front of MIT, because right now how we do it, it's been one of the, the major uh, urban water revitalization projects in the country um, over 30 years, but how they actually test water quality is with a guy named Rob who goes out in a kayak every day and measures across. Even in ice, he'll drill holes and actually measure the water quality. So instead of having just one of him, we actually got, want to magnify his ability and actually give him a fleet of mini Robs to actually go out. Um, so this will actually be our, uh, our urban water probe, um, navigating a difficult area. I mean, if it goes off, it's gonna you know, run into the John Hancock building or something in our city. But um, we're really excited to be working with someone here and actually we can show this off. This is super sexy, I have to say. I haven't actually seen it in person, so this is great. This is beautiful. Um, so this will be flying very shortly. So, uh, but you know, of course, I'm here uh, representing the lab, but it's not just me. You know, we have projects all over the world, but we also have a ton of people who all deserve acclaim and, uh, and acclamation. So on behalf of all of us at uh, the Sensible City Lab and all of us at MIT, thank you for the opportunity um, for us to be here, especially at your inaugural uh, Digital Tuesdays. I've taken a little bit more time and I've kept you from your drinks. I'm sorry about that, but I'll hand uh, the, the podium over. Anthony, thank you. Um, a worthy inaugural speaker. It's been absolutely fascinating, and you're warmly welcome to Wales. It's been an absolute delight uh, listening to you. Uh, a round of applause once again, please, for Anthony.
Um, ladies and gentlemen, this, this conference has made a huge impact, I know, not just on the, the businesses and the, the children and the students who were here yesterday, and not just here, but around the world. I just want to share with you some stats. Uh, on day one, uh, there were over 2,300 tweets about Digital 2014, uh, and also on day one, 1,600 online delegates watching all around the world, New Zealand, Australia, many of them getting in contact uh, through the web stream. And uh, I haven't got the stats yet for day two, but that's only day one. So uh, you are still very warmly welcome indeed. I haven't welcomed you today, by the way, for those watching online, um, but um, we're delighted you're with us uh, in spirit, and I hope you've been uh, made to feel very welcome indeed. Um, now, um, you need to know that this Tech Tuesday is not just about being uh, talked to by the world's most interesting speakers. Uh, it's also an opportunity to draw on expertise and for you to put people on the spot, uh, which is why it really is going to be worth being part of Text Tuesday. So before we go off for drinks, um, I'd like to um, suggest we finish uh, in here on an open mic session, which isn't going to take very long indeed, um, for you to have the opportunity to ask questions, to pitch ideas. You've been talked at pretty much all day. We've had very limited opportunity uh, to give you an opportunity to get in and, and talk and ask questions, for which I apologize, but we've had so many speakers of such wonderful quality, uh, that's the way it's had to be. So please, would you welcome back Terry, Anthony Vanke, Simon Gibson, uh, welcome Chris Gabriel, David Warrender from Welsh Government, Jason Hart, and Tom Kelly back to the stage to uh, take part in our panel discussion. A round of applause for them, please. Um, so lights up as high as they'll go, please, guys. And uh, this is your opportunity, ladies and gentlemen. Please just bear in mind our viewers watching online, and it just makes it so much easier if you just observe the conventions of hand uh, high in the air, wave to me, tell me your name uh, and your question. We'll run a microphone over to you, and please tell us your name and your question. That makes it much easier indeed for, uh, for our viewers. Uh, in, in fact, more, more to the point, our cameras to grab them. As far as microphones go, I think that, guys, you're going to have to share microphones, so don't hog them, pass them around. Um, who's going to go first? Um, give us a way for a question, a pitch, an observation. You're, Can I ask a question? I'm, I'm not I'm having someone sure that's not allowed, on stage and not asking a question. You've hijacked it now. Go um, on. Uh, not to put you on the spot, but you mentioned data there and all the work you're doing around the... Uh, the, the world. I'm on New York City's open data website and live now are business, city government, education, health, environment, housing development, public safety, all data sets that New York City now provide open source to developers. What can the Welsh Government do in that light? Do you think government have a role to play? Because in New York I know they've created hundreds of thousands of jobs now in that space. What do you think the Welsh Government could do in that space to really drive some of, the, some of this uh, innovation? I don't know which mic is on. I think your head, your head mic is on. You're probably Ooh. okay without Ooh. the stick. All right. Without the, without this the is karaoke. Fun, hey? uh, I can talk without a microphone. This is fun. <laughs> you know, I think there's a. It's maybe just also my kind of like political viewpoint. I think government does have a role. Because I think also New York or any of these cities that really started it, they were the only people that had a capacity to actually get the discussion started. I mean, from New York with the open data to the mayor's office in Boston that was the first to create. Uh, basically, not even a think tank, but like a lab within the city who only answers to the mayor, so they can do whatever the heck they want uh, with new technologies, data, piloting things, to actually get the discussion going on what is it that this looks like. The fact that, as you stated, uh, young entrepreneurs are creating the new killer apps for the city. You know, the real time, uh, you know, I, I use this, this really old um, real time transit app in Boston. Uh, and I use it because it was created by a 17-year-old. He has since gone off to school. He hasn't updated it, but it's still the best working one in the city of Boston. He actually um, is also, I think, the best-selling one in San Francisco because he used the same code in San Francisco. So you can definitely create an ecosystem. But I think for government or for parties, you, you are in a unique position to be able to really start this because people are always, I think, a little skeptical if a company just brings in and says, look, this is the solution, this is the idea. But for government, your mission is different. Yours is to serve the companies, the people, the citizens, the guests, all of that. And I think strategically, it makes sense, you know, both as a, a democratic society, but also 
how do you improve the standard of life in your community when funds are not flowing as easily anymore? At least in the United States, I mean, look at Congress, they can't pass a budget. You know, how can we ask them to help any of our cities? Uh, so cities have to step up and they don't have the money so that they have to do it more intelligently. So government absolutely has a role. I think for, and I'm not as familiar with what the discussions are in Wales already, but where does it make sense? What data sets make sense? Is it the transportation apps? Is it uh, environment? Do people care about the environment? Do people care about constituency aspects? Or maybe you start with billing and really create a sunlight foundation type of thing to just you know, open the windows, let in the fresh air, but use that just to, as a small pilot to see how people are, are using it and then build it from there. You never know where it goes. I mean, I don't think that um, when data.gov in the United States opened that there would be an entire ecosystem of people trying to get the other party out of power. You know, that's a whole industry, you know, now. Um, using kind of the, the, the power and the agency of the data, you know, while still, of course, respecting those scary issues of privacy and anonymity. Let me bring in um, David Warrender, who is here from Welsh Government. I mean, after two days of this, this conference, what do you take away uh, from the people you've heard? We've heard from children, we've heard from students, we've heard from businesses, uh, we've heard from teachers. W what are the messages that you will take away from here? What are you doing right and what are you getting wrong and what will you do about it? It's <laughs> <laughs> uh, a fair question. It is a fair question. Um, well, I, th I think first of all, uh, the reason we put this event together uh, was just to uh, raise visibility and debate around digital uh, in Wales and tr try to showcase Wales as a digital nation. Uh, I think over the two days we've seen some really interesting things. We've seen a huge amount of debate uh, around young people, educators and businesses and actually um, all having interests to solve the same problem, and all realising, I think, that they can all contribute to solving that same problem. So I think um, there's been a great learning about the need to bring uh, those groups together, and to bring those groups together uh, much more frequently, uh, and to try and help empower those groups to kind of do something about solving some of the issues that we face. Um, I think today has been... Uh, quite enlightening as well, and uh, Anthony's um, discussion there was very good. If I think about digital public services, um, one of the questions or one of the points that Anthony raised there was about resources. Uh, you know, there aren't a huge amount of resources uh, in the public sector in general terms. Uh, we distribute the uh, efforts of our digital solutions right the way across the nation. I think we need to pool resources, we need a lot more co cooperation, uh, and we need to make sure we, we create the resource, the budget, uh, and the people to try out some of these innovations. Let me bring Terry in. Um, what, what do you want to see Welsh Government do? What would you like to see Welsh Government doing more of? What is Welsh Government not doing that you would like to see done? Well, I think this, uh, this 2014 conference has been very good. You know, I think the numbers are 50% up from a year ago. The single most important thing to success is persistence. So what have we done? We, for two years running, this government has run this digital conference. And I understand it will be held again next year. My guess is that, that uh, from what I've heard, you actually cut off the numbers this year. I don't think if I was in charge, David, I would cut the numbers off. I know in India they even hang off the walls at some of these conferences, you know. And the other thing is, what, what did we decide to do? Uh, we decided to have every month this Tech Tuesday, again, persistence, getting people involved, whether that's government people involved, whether it's businesses getting involved. The sort of things that's going on today in the world of digital, ICT, whether it's mobile devices that are smart, or 4G, or cloud, or big data, there is not a single sector that is not being affected by these changes in technology. There are huge opportunities out there. I mean, imagine that little company called WhatsApp for 19 billion with 55 people. Are you kidding? They have no sales, no profit, and a $19 billion valuation. And don't think you couldn't do that here. Exactly. Don't think that. Exactly. That would be wrong. 
Thank you very much. I'm very aware that um, we shouldn't have the panellists uh, asking each other questions. Uh, let, let me bring uh, you in. Uh, whether you want to pitch, question, make statements, give us feedback on, on today and yesterday, um, put your hand up, give me a, a big wave, and we'll run a microphone over to you. Anyone in the audience want to, uh, to come in here? Uh, anyone want to chip in? Sorry, yeah. Uh, over here, yeah. Just tell us your name, just for the sake of our, our cameras and people who are watching Hello, outside. Um, I'm Jake, and, oh, sorry, uh, the question I want to put is, is, like, Wales, we're only a small country. Do you think we can, like, compete with countries such as China, the US, and with, like, digital software? Because it may, it may be a numbers game. There's, like, three million people in Wales. If, it, if it's a numbers game, we're clearly at a disadvantage. It's a very good question, and uh, well, Anthony Vanky, what, what about that question? Is, is being small good, or is being small bad? What's the what's the phrase that on the internet no one knows you're a dog? You know, I think that's. I've the never case. heard that before. Yeah. So you know, I, and especially because what the the there's a lot of controversy with the Turing test results this weekend. You know, but is it a 13 year old boy on the other side? Anyone can come up with a million, billion, trillion dollar idea. You know, I think. Ultimately, it's about the idea, because the tools, I think, especially right now, the barriers to entry are dropping quickly. The fact that if you want to learn how to code, anyone can go online and do it, either learn from YouTube or from your peers, or there are support groups, to hackathons, to Code Academy, all of these things. That it really ultimately comes down to the good idea. So I think for... You know, a country like Wales, why not? Three million or something? I think three and a half million here. I mean, I think, you know, you could say, well, Boston is, you know, three and a half billion, uh, three and a half million as well. So, you know, uh, scale doesn't matter. And I think that, you Can know, I, well, an well, idea is an idea. Let me bring in Simon Gibson. I mean, I don't know how many people you ear, uh, eavesdropped on yesterday, uh, Simon, but what I take away from the last two days is just listening to kids who were probably rather underconfident, I thought, a typical Welsh thing we're Welsh, we won't be able to do this. And by the end of yesterday, people leaving here fizzing with belief. It's a particularly Welsh problem, isn't it? Clearly the talent is here, clearly the ability is here. What we're often poor at is confidence. How do you instill confidence into, and it is kids we need to get on board here as quickly as possible. Primary school we were hearing about yesterday. How do you, how do you fix that? that? In fact, that's one of your tasks, really, isn't it? Yes, well, a friend of mine is a teacher in Merthyr Tydfil, in a very challenged area. It's up on the Gurnos. Uh, probably one of the most challenged areas in the whole of the United Kingdom. Anthony, we'll take you there for a drink tomorrow lunchtime, OK? You'll like it very much. You'll like it. And... <laughs> The message I got from him last night is, what happened today at the conference? We sent some kids from our school to here. And he said, unbelievable, the change, when they got back. They came here probably with little hope. Many of them are you know, in environments where there's third generation unemployment and economic inactivity. They came to an event like this. They saw the scope of it. They, they started to rub shoulders, perhaps, with people that had succeeded, had enjoyed their life, were passionate about their careers, and had created some wealth. And it was rubbing off. One day mm -hmm. is all it mm -hmm. takes sometimes to have that epiphany that these young people need to motivate themselves. And Chris Gabriel from Logic I mean, the, the trouble is this is one day. In fact, it's two days. But the, the big challenges for businesses, yours uh, and every other business in the room here, is, is in a sense to stop seeing education, schools and kids as something to be kept away until they finish their degrees and then suddenly a relationship starts. And one of the big messages came over yesterday was why not, why aren't people like you going into schools at very, very early ages and inspiring the next generation? It, it's a fair point, or, it, or is that not possible? I, I think it's a very fair point. I think I was speaking to someone earlier on today who runs an apprentice, apprentice program. And I said to her, you're going to be very busy after this, this event <laughs> because I think there is a, there's a sense of it needs to be done. And I think we, we, do, we do, I think, and I, th uh, I think we do what we think we should do, but what we've done is not what we need to do in the future. And I think that's come out of this conference is the dynamic between government and business and education has to change. And I think this is the catalyst to, to do it. Uh, the one thing I'd say about scale, 
actually this is one of the few places you can do this kind of event. It's the, it's the largest audience I've walked into a room in a long time. You couldn't do this in, in England even because of the different, the scale of that. You can pull the levers in Wales, and I think part of that education and innovation. I've got an 11 and 7 year old daughter, and I've gone, I, even I'm going home excited about what I, from, a, from that perspective, and I'm a CTO, and even I think I've missed <laughs> some of that uh, excitement that my girls should have. So I think that will come, I think it's between what we do this year and next year is the key. Okay, if it's just another event 12 months from now, that's, that's the missed opportunity. And Jason Hart, we saw you hacking earlier on. For those of you who are out at workshops, Jason uh, hacked everyone in the room, which was you know, very unpleasant, frankly. Um, one of the things you, you watch in the media all the time in the UK are the mixed messages. You'll see the, the, the tabloid screaming about um, kids spending too much time on their computers and parents worrying about what they're watching. We do have this schizophrenic view, don't we, in terms of kids on the net and kids getting upskilled in terms of ICT. And it's difficult for parents who perhaps may not be digitally fluent uh, to try and know where they should be coming from in terms of their own teaching and their own impacts at home in terms of encouraging children to, to go online? Yeah, I, I think we have to start from an education from a school from an early age um, of the dangers of posting content, etc. But also the, you know, the data, the storing, how they're using passwords, using the same password, just the whole, you know, the whole concept of education and doing one little thing or de creating a new app, you know, have you thought about security from day one? Because in every major product out there, security is always an afterthought. So if you start designing and creating apps and then try forcing security into it after, it never happens. So as part of Digital Wales, that creativ creativity, think about security and the, the acceptance, the user experience, making security transparent and visible. Because you know, if you do become successful in the app, and it becoming a global kind of phenomenon, that app will be worth three, four, three or four times more if security is built into it from day one. Okay, thank you very much. I'm gonna stop you there. You might have hacked my phone, but you're not gonna go on forever. Um, um, uh, time to squeeze more of you in. Gentlemen here, um, please tell us your name and your question, where you're from, please. Yeah, hi, my name's Simon Powell and I'm from ESIS. Um, just a, a comment really, uh, being somebody in Wales and, and growing businesses for quite a while, someone asked about the opportunity Wales has and can we do it? We absolutely can. And uh, you know, from everything that's been announced at Digital Youth Club, Software Universities, the Innovation Company, Digital Tuesday, I think that we really can make a difference. But as everybody said, you know, in my view, that needs to support, needs to support government, and we really need to make sure that that support continues and that we can really make a difference to, for Wales to succeed. I think we had David Warrington's assurance that um, he was behind this and we'd be back here next year. Thank you very much for your points. And uh, I'm going to squeeze that question in there. Yes, sir, uh, tell us your, uh, your question and your name. Hi, my name is uh, Saki Bigbal, and uh, my, uh, it's not really a question, it's kind of like a comment as well. That's fine. Um, I was wondering, could there be a platform for youngsters? Because um, I remember going to BT Inspirational Week and I gained so much confident, uh, confidence there. And I know we are doing Digital Tuesdays now, but could there be a platform online for, business, uh, for businesses or companies to offer work experiences or training to youngsters so they could go on there and gain, gain more training and confidence because that is the key to the success. It's a very good point. Uh, Simon Gibson, you, you were launching um, kids computer classes basically. I just want you to pick up this point that there is this possibility that you, you, we now miss uh, that age group between people who have left school. Uh, by the way, you're going to be warmly invited to every Tuesday, Tech Tuesday, okay? There's no, there's no age limit on Tech Tuesday, is there? There's no age limit, no, no problem. So the elderly can come and very young people as well. I mean, I should tell you that at the Tech Tuesday I've been running, some of the people are 90 years old <laughs> and some of the kids are 12 and they have a great time. So we've established that, there is no age limit. Um, so you're welcome and friends, bring them here uh, for Tech Tuesday. Simon, on this very point, okay, we're gonna go after uh, kids with computer classes. What about when they stop being uh, of school age and what about getting a hold of them? Well, we've got a number of interventions. One idea is the software university, a two-year degree course, three semesters a year, no breaks, 
a total alignment with industry from the day that you start. You have an industrial project as an undergraduate straight away. Um, hopefully that we'll get back to the old HND days where people had a job offer before they even went to university. And you know, that is an exciting opportunity to capture some young people who perhaps are brilliant. And we've learned this at Alacrity, by the way. Some of our best people are not computer science graduates. They've come from other disciplines and they've been absolutely incredibly good. Uh, and so it, it's not always just a matter of sweeping up comp science grads. It's a matter of sweeping up people that perhaps wouldn't have thought traditionally they were well suited to it. Um, and we've got the digital youth clubs to try and activate people in, in, during that period as well. There's a lot of interventions going on, but you, it's a very good point. You know, there's nothing better if you've got a, a, a good company that, to, to, to offer work placements and for, for particularly secondary school kids. But here's the thing, my children have done it. Um, I'll just quickly tell you, my, one of my sons, was not doing so well. So one, I had him one day in a radiator factory with a wire brush. Sorry, one week. Mask on, all day long scrubbing down radiators. And the second week he spent with us. And I remember we took him, Terry, do you remember, to, to the meetings and he saw the other side of life. It had the most transformative effect on my son because he realized those in the radiator factory had abandoned their education, hated life, were low paid, and just lived to get... Wrecked, wrecked at the weekend. The second week he met people that were educated, passionate, and were earning a good living. And it, you know, it, 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 that's a big message to send out a 15 year old. So I, I suppose my plea is, if we're offer, offering young people places in the work, for, for work experience, let's make sure they have great experiences. Don't just bring them on board and let them tag along with the janitor or something. Thank you for that. And just a word once again, um, you know there's these forms on your desk to fill out so we can keep in touch with you. I'm going to squeeze one last comment in here. Um, very, very brief point, so tell us your name and your question. Uh, Andy Williams from Cohesive. Um, I've, I've spent a very short time at the conference. It's been excellent. I noticed that it's uh, an investment sort of in, in innovation and in ideas and in aspiration. If I look at where the Welsh Government's spending its money, it's actually in infrastructure. So there's 500 million being invested in infrastructure, which is very much needed. I guess my question to the panel is, is to get this stuff off the ground, do we need a similar level of investment from the Welsh Government? David Warrender. <laughs> no, I'm not picking on you, it's just you're the best person to answer the question. Uh, well, I, I'm kind of the wrong person to ask in the sense that my answer is um, yes. Uh, I represent digital, so I, I would love more investment. I recognise in government, you know, I'm, I'm competing with loads of other priorities. Um, what I would say, though, about the infrastructure investment is that, um, you know, part, part of government's role must be to try and build infrastructure to allow innovation to happen. I think if we don't build um, uh, a good uh, backbone infrastructure across Wales on a national basis, we will stifle uh, innovation. So I, I, I think that's a good investment uh, that we are making and we, we, need, we need to do it just to, um, as a hygiene factor to compete with other nations. Uh, but absolutely, um, if anyone's got great ideas to bring more funding to my area, to do more of this, to drive more innovation, uh, I'm very willing to listen. Thank you very much. I'm getting the evil eyeball from the producer, so uh, we are going to have to uh, call it time. So, ladies and gentlemen, a huge round of applause for our panel. Thank you very much.